Hello and welcome to Stand in the Gap, the program dedicated to identifying key cultural issues affecting our nation and the church in America. Our purpose on this program and our Stand in the Gap radio programs, all part of the American Pastors Network, is to evaluate selected cultural issues from a biblical worldview perspective so that those who know the truth can better understand the challenges facing us today and improve our collective and individual ability to impact the culture for Christ. Now, in addition, our prayer is that those who have not yet considered the issues through the lens of a biblical worldview can be encouraged to consider that the Bible indeed does hold all the answers to all issues of life. Today, I'm going to be joined again by Pastor Isaac Crockett, as well, we're going to invite back to our program Dr. Dylan Burroughs, co-host of Truth for a New Generation and senior writer at the John Ankerberg Show. Our emphasis for today is Generation Z, the generation immediately following the millennial generation. And we're going to consider whether there's evidence within this generation that suggests that in the midst of great spiritual darkness in our culture, that some light is beginning to shine in that generation. Our theme for today is this, Generation Z, Evidences of a Spiritual Awakening. Let's start first by defining several key words or phrases in order to better understand our program today. Now first, when I say a biblical worldview perspective, it's that worldview held by most of our America's founders. It's the worldview that underpins our Declaration of Independence, the United States Constitution, the understanding of justice and truth and the rule of law. It's in essence what many collectively refer to as the Judeo-Christian worldview. Now these four pillars of a biblical worldview include the concept of God, creation, the fall, and redemption through Jesus Christ. Now every person has a worldview, but for us on this program, what I've just defined is the worldview through which we examine issues on this program and how we personally view all of life. Now secondly, let me define the Generation Z, because I think a lot of you would have questions about this, at who the generations are. So it'll make more sense when we refer to Generation Z in this program when I lay out the things I'll go over right now. The generation of which I am a part, and likely a large percentage of you watching the program right now, are the baby boomers. This is the group born between 1944 and 1964, a 20-year spread. Those are people with now between the ages of 54 and 74, and they comprise a group of people in our culture of almost 76 million people. Now, Generation X is the next generation. This group was born between 1965 and 1979. They're between the ages of 39 and 53, and they comprise a segment of the population slightly larger than the baby boomers, 82 million. Now, Generation uh, Y, or the millennial group, are those born between 1980 and 1994. They are those between the ages of 24 and 38, and they comprise a segment larger than Generation Z at approximately 95 million, and they right now, at this point anyways, represent the largest single voting bloc in America. Now, Generation Z, the one we're talking about today, is the youngest, but perhaps believed to be the largest generation of all. They're born between 1995 and 2015. They are now between the ages of three and 23. And according to research comprising, they comprise 25% of the population and believe that they may in fact be the largest number ever in the United States. Now Generation Z is actually a designation given as a placeholder name for the youngest Americans. Today we're talking about this youngest generation, many of whom are clearly children, still framing their opinions and view of God, of parents, of life, and are being hit from all sides with a worldview that leaves out God and morality, but are by research reacting to the confusion of their millennial parents and evidencing some conservative actions in their thinking. And with that, I want to go now to Isaac Crockett. Isaac, you are a millennial. You're in that group. Um, 
Give me just a little bit of a uh, of view. We've talked before about the millennials having a two or three percent of the biblical worldview, and younger they even have less. Why is it that as we become younger, it appears that we have a less of a knowledge of a biblical worldview of God, of fall, of creation, of fall and redemption? Why is that? You think Proverbs twenty two talks a lot about this in verse six. It says, "Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he's older, he won't depart from it." Uh, Psalm 1 talks about the blessed man and what he does. But just real quickly, if you look at it, the generation before us had 7% biblical worldview. Before that, 16%. Uh, in that same study, Barna says that um, only 10% of Americans have that. So we, we are just slowly falling away. And if you remember, the Ten Commandments and things like that have been taken out of the public schools. So we are, just, we are the result Hmm. of those decisions to distance ourselves from the Word of God. So we you're basically saying, ignorant. Isaac, Yeah, that, we're ignorant of the Bible. So you're saying, basically saying that where we are is a trend that we have been experiencing for a long time, and now we're down with a generation that knows very little. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, when we come back in just a moment, we're going to talk with Dr. B Dylan Burroughs about this Generation Z, about where they are in their spiritual lives and really how they got there truth, flexible or permanent, the Bible, ancient history or powerfully relevant, culture, a reflection of enlightenment or warning signs, the pastor, commentator or frontline combatant. Every day, American Pastors Network speaks to these questions where and when they matter with hundreds of affiliate radio stations nationwide. A website and mobile app screening today's headlines through the twin lenses of the Bible and the Constitution. Educating, informing, equipping. This is the American Pastors Network. The time is now to stand in the gap for truth. Welcome back to Stand in the Gap, and today we talk with our special guest. He's returning uh, to talk with us again, Dr. Dylan Burroughs. So, uh, Dylan, thanks so much for being with us. And I just want to tell uh, our, our viewing audience, too, that uh, Dr. Burroughs has written a lot of books. So not only is he a co-host for Truth for a New Generation and a senior writer at the John Ankerberg Show, but he has done a lot of writing. If you go on Amazon uh, and look up his name as an author, he has authored or co-authored uh, many, many books and booklets and pamphlets, so uh, very helpful uh, to, to do that and to look at it. But uh, Dylan, thanks for being back with us and from uh, peop two, the two of us are close in age. I'm, I guess, technically an older millennial and you would be a younger generation uh, uh, X. And uh, we come from a similar background, but uh, just kind of outside of each other's range. But um, we were just talking a little bit about millennials and now especially Generation Z and the, the biblical illiteracy, I guess you could call it, the lack of a biblical worldview. And uh, we, we kind of look at this thinking, but I was wondering if you could put into terms, um, almost if you were describing it like you were a doctor, looking at the health of this generation as an organism or as a person, how would you diagnose the condition, the spiritual condition of this, the youngest generation, Generation Z? Well, if I could offer one diagnosis, it would be that today's teenagers are the most connected of any generation in history, but also the loneliest generation. I remember leading a youth Bible study a few years ago and mentioned having divorce in my family's background. And I asked people to raise their hand if they had experienced divorce in their family, and every single hand was raised. And these were churched kids in a youth group setting. Hmm. You know, technology has not fixed our loneliness problem. We can have 1,000 friends on Instagram or on Facebook, but lack one person we can share a deep conversation with. So more than ever, a person who is willing to talk about faith, you have to invest in their life personally to get that open door to build that trust. Dylan, let me follow up a little bit more. Basically, what, you're, what I hear you describing and what we sense is that, if I put it in medical terms, um, the, the, the patient, Generation Z, those between 3 and 24, the youngest generation we're talking about right now, is spiritually sick. You really went to the point of saying they're really, really deficient and needy in the area of relationships in particular is where you went. 
let me take the logical next step, all right? If I go to a doc and the doc says, all right, you're not feeling good, you're sick, I'm going to want to say, how'd I get this way? Uh, I want you to describe now, how has it happened that this generation has developed this diagnosis as you've given, spiritually sick and relationally, relationally weak? How'd they get there? Well, that's good to bring out because the boomer generation popularized a self-focus, especially regarding sexual relationships. So Generation X, my generation, became the first truly fatherless generation. And today, more than 40 percent of American children are born into a home without a married father and mother. So we're now seeing the third generation of broken families, and it's impacting our culture in a multitude of ways. Uh, to give an example, the church once served as the conscience or the guardrails of American society, but now many youth groups have a different group every other week because their students are at the other parent's house every other weekend. And of course, with broken families come a broken church. Many of the problems in our churches today are the result of church leaders who have experienced their own family problems. And personally, I meet with young pastors today who lack a single mentor or father figure. They're just out there on their own trying to make it work without someone backing them up. And it's an issue impacting many churches as the next generation becomes the leadership in the local church today. Hmm. You know, Dylan, you were talking about the loneliness and you and I both have, you uh, have children that are in the older, a little bit on the older side of the Generation Z. I have children on the younger side of Generation Z. But you know, I, I don't think it, it uh, hits just Generation Z. I think a lot of millennial and other younger pastors are in that exact same thing. That's why here at the American Pastors Network, we actually have an initiative uh, bridging the gap, trying to work on that. But uh, there are so many things hitting. And I think sometimes it's easy for one generation to look at the one behind them and say, oh, why don't you guys do a better job with this? Or to blame the generation that came before us and say, oh, come on, mom and dad or grandma and grandpa, you know, your generation, you really messed things up for us. But the honest truth, Peter warns us in 1 Peter chapter 5 that Satan is very strategic. And sometimes uh, our families, sometimes our churches have not maybe been strategically following God's word in a way to, to plan ahead. And in Proverbs chapter 22, where it talks about training up a child, it says um, that a prudent man foresees the evil and hides himself from it, but the simple pass on and are punished. And then it says, train up a child in the way he should go. And so could you maybe expound upon some of the dangers that, we, that are lurking around every corner? Satan is a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour, uh, 1 Peter chapter 5. And so he goes, first and foremost, the lion goes for the youngest and or the weakest. And so we have just an acceptance of evil and abundance in our culture. We have a media that is pushing all kinds of perverted forms of, of, of family or lack thereof. We have an educational system that pushes it, even in politics. So could you maybe kind of talk us through what those, those results are in these younger generations? Well, that's a good way to put it, because on the family side, when there is a lacking parental supervision or church influence, the generation looks to one another as family. And this can be concerning because the result is generally not a biblical worldview, but a view that reflects our culture. And we have tremendous information at our fingertips, yet lack the discernment to wisely navigate life as a young person. And on the church side, pastors and church leaders are often hurting as much as those in their church. They feel like they can't let others know their real struggles and keep this Instagram lifestyle up. And it leads to unhealthy expressions in different forms in their own lives. And a silence in the pulpit is one problem, but I'm shocked at how many church leaders and youth leaders personally struggle with pornography or even openly proclaim how much they like certain shows or movies that are filled with immorality. We need an awakening among students in Generation Z, but it's also a need in our homes and in our churches. That's really the core of where the change needs to take place. And, and Dell, I want to follow up with you on that because I think uh, we're in a good direction here right now. Isaac kind of set it up. The media, the culture, we can describe it as the devil. Jesus describes it as wolves, disciples going out into a climate of wolves. But we know that these things are hostile to Christian life and Christian living. And certainly, as Isaac said, our children are very vulnerable. But, but a lot of people would look and say, these things are happening because evil is so strong. But you also mentioned there about our churches, our pulpits, and you used the word silence. I'm going to ask you to kind of balance a little bit there with 
Is it more the silence and the ineffectiveness of living the Christian example and what God says that drives where we are? Or is it are we just now come upon a, an emboldened evil? Um, work that out because these two have always existed from the beginning. And I just want people to be thinking clearly here about how do we get to where we are? Did we go silent on the truth and then evil came up? Or has evil come up and, there, and truth has become more silent? What do you say? Well, and that's a good comparison and contrasting type of situation, but really it's a both and situation where you see evil on the increase, but you also see many who should be speaking out against that evil being quiet about it, being silent about it, or acting like it's not a big deal. And so when young people see the older generation or their influencers, their pastors, their parents, their coaches, their teachers say, oh, it's not a big deal, or they live in sin themselves, it doesn't look like it's that bad for them to partake in in their own lives. So when you lack that mentoring type of situation, that one generation to the next, like 2 Timothy 2, 2 talks about, you're going to see those kind of problems. And that's why for Generation Z and, and younger, if we want to see change taking place, we have to do our part and set an example with our own lives and then invest in that next generation instead of blaming them or saying it's their fault. We are the ones who have to take responsibility to step up and get involved. Uh, Dylan, we're going to go into that specifically in our next segment, but I wanted you to wrap up this segment now by really sharing with us what you are finding. And that's really our theme. Uh, are there evidences of spiritual awakening within this youngest generation? And if so, how do you quantify it, and how are you making the claim that it is or it's not? What do you tell us? Yes. Well, it can look dark and gloomy out there, but when you actually talk to students and you get beyond the media hype, I see three things that are really positive. And one is what I call the shrinking middle. And by that, I mean in the past, people would at least say they're Christian or act Christian, but now it's just as popular to say you're not a Christian or you're into some other religion. So the people who say, I'm a Christian, as a teenager, it really means something for them, and they're really living out their faith, so there's less cultural Christianity, and I believe that's a good thing. But a second sign I'm seeing is the shift among Generation Z that is from talking to doing. No longer are they content to show up at a camp or a Bible study or play laser tag and play video games and eat pizza and goof off all the time. They wanna go out and feed the poor. They wanna go out and help the sick. They wanna go out and do something. And volunteerism in this generation is up overall, but when we can incorporate that as part of our spiritual life, it makes an impact that has both social and spiritual impact. And then a third thing is there's a stronger correlation now between the person and the message. So when you see a pastor who's involved in a scandal, that not only hurts the church, but it hurts the believers who uh, are looking for leaders. It hurts those on the outside who are looking to the church for help. And if you can personally be an influence that lives out your faith consistently, it has an authority that's stronger than any media, that's stronger than any message, any movie, that we can pour into a student's life and make a difference that changes eternity. Ladies and gentlemen, we're, we're talking with Dr. Dylan Burroughs uh, today, and we're talking about the Generation Z, the youngest generation. Many of you watching would have grandchildren in this generation, perhaps, as we look at them. What are you thinking about them? <clears throat> are you invested in them? We're going to come back in just a moment, and we're going to talk about how we, those who are watching, parents, grandparents of Generation Z in particular, can help to kindle what, doc, what Dr. Burroughs is talking about, are evidences of light, a desire for truth, a desire for authenticity. How can we help them, this next generation coming up? We'll be right back. Stand in the Gap is produced and recorded in the studios of WBPH Philadelphia, positively different television. To watch archives of this program, go to WBPH.org.
Welcome back to Stand in the Gap. And Dylan, I want to go back to you right now in our closing comments. Um, we've presented some reality. Generation Z, 3 to 24, the youngest of those that are out there right now, um, as a whole are sick spiritually. But you've evidenced that there is some alertness to spiritual awakening. They're wanting to know the truth. There's an evidence that they are wanting authenticity. So I'm going to ask you a very direct question here right now. What can those who are watching this program, I'm going to put in there pastors, grandmothers and grandfathers, many are watching this program, moms and dads, what can they do most effectively to help this next generation come to a knowledge of who Jesus Christ is and to have a relationship with Him that they so strongly, you're evidencing, really want? Yes. Well, many students are lacking helpful mentoring, leaving people to figure out life for themselves. I call this a DIY spiritual growth that leads to roller coaster spiritual experiences among young believers. And so the real need is to mentor the next generation. So if you could find one person to pour into, 2 Timothy 2 2 is all about equipping others who will equip others still. You know, we often view discipleship as teaching someone about God, but instead we can think of it as coaching an athlete who will later grow up and be a coach of younger athletes themselves. So we have this idea of not just helping that person, but helping the person who will help others. And if we each helped one or two people over the next year, that could be the greatest investment you made in the future of our country. You think about Jesus. He had 12 men. He poured three years into them, and they literally changed the world. We can see a great spiritual awakening take place when we invest on a small scale but a final word I must say is that we have to start with our own lives. We can't live however we want and expect to have great influence on the next generation. A mentoring relationship works when you say like Paul did, follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. So we start with our own heart, but then we step out of our comfort zone and help one or two other people take that next step spiritually. You know, that, that is so helpful and uh, it makes so much sense. Now, Sam, at the beginning, we were talking about the generations and the lack of biblical worldview. And so you have the, you know, 16% of the 60 and older had a bit of biblical worldview. Then the next generation, only seven, now four. So you're at, you're at that older generation, technically, and you have children that are millennials. You have grandchildren that are Generation Z. And it's so hard to find that time. And, and there are many people who have tried rearing their children in the way of the Lord and each person, each individual is responsible for himself or herself. But what are some tips for doing exactly what Dylan said, mentoring, even starting with your own children and grandchildren for mentoring them or spending time together? Well, Isaac, I'm glad you asked that question. And ladies and gentlemen, I'll just speak to you directly, if I can, to those who, many of them are my generation. If you have grandchildren, and most of you probably do, you have children and grandchildren. I have six children. Uh, I have 14 grandchildren. Uh, my question to you is, are you praying for them? Are you, are you interfacing with them? Moms and dads, you have a relationship to encourage your children to come to an early knowledge in Jesus Christ, but you have an obligation to live before them a life of holiness and righteousness so that they actually see that there's something to this thing called Christianity and a life of, of uh, believing in Christ. But grandma and granddads, you may think, I'm going to again talk to you as a grandfather. You, you may think your job's done when your children are raised. They're not. The biblical principle is fathers to sons to grandsons. Perhaps mom and dad, grandma and grandpa in particular, you may have a greater opportunity to influence the lives of your grandchildren, perhaps even than their parents. You have an obligation and an opportunity. I would encourage you, Remain engaged until God takes you to glory if you know the Lord. Focus on your grandchildren. Let them know your experiences of your walk with God. Hopefully you have a walk with God. If you don't, get one. But if you do, share it in what God has done for you. It will give your grandchildren more hope and more instruction than you can imagine. Why does it work? Because that's God's model. And God's model always works. Well, thanks for being with us today on Stand in the Gap. We're glad that you're with us. And again, I encourage all of you who watch this program, and we're, we're so glad to hear from people all across the country. Take just a moment. On the screen is our number, a contact point. Let us know that you are in being benefited by this program. Share with us. 
those words to help us to know how to better present the truth of God's Word to the issues of the day to help you and all Americans know better how to impact the culture for Christ and to stand in the gap for truth. God bless you, and we'll see you back next week on this same program, Stand in the Gap.